hello. So, uh, um, nice to be here. I'd like to present a research study that I did, and I think in this time and day that we, we are very confused about research. Uh, medical research tends to be bought and paid for, and uh, it's very difficult to come to various conclusions. Um, and so working in the Graduate Division of Educational Research at the University of Calgary, it was my responsibility to teach graduate students uh, quantitative research methods, and I'd like to let you in on how that is done. Um, so what I wanted to do is study the uh, and assess the effect, the affect, the feeling on a person of the Great Pyramid on the human energy field and the chakra system. And so um, <clears throat> what I noticed going to Egypt for the first time in 1977, and consistently after that, that I was becoming more psychic the longer I spent inside the Great Pyramid. And so I wanted to configure a way to measure that. And so um, what I was looking at is how do we measure consciousness fields? And I understand that this is a conference on spirituality and science. And in one of my undergrad degrees, um, I, I started um, measuring how you can see the human aura, what are devices that can measure subtle fields and how can we actually assess what is going on uh, that can increase consciousness fields. What is so, this are you yeah, sharing I, something? Are you sharing I, something? Simon? Are you I'm sharing something? a PowerPoint. Do you not see it? I, I don't see it. Uh, can you please uh, click on share screen button and then start sharing? We don't see anything. Oh. Apologies to interrupt you. <laughs> Okay, now I have to back up. I'm really sorry. It's good now. All right, so I'll just go through the first few screens that I was speaking to. And you'll notice the, the light orbs that are moving through um, the scene. All right now? Yeah, it's all light, thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, just continuing with what I was saying, um, I wanted to assess if there was any link with the inside of the king's chamber inside the sarcophagus and increased consciousness. Now, what does that mean? And when we look at uh, various um, stories, um, we can the Great Pyramid was not a tomb. That's the essence of the pyramid code. Uh, it was a chamber for uh, high level initiates to somehow connect with the other world. And uh, there's no word for death in Egypt. And so something about getting into the position of the sarcophagus with your head in the proper direction uh, would begin to have an effect on human consciousness. So what the ancient initiates wanted to do was move into another state of consciousness to understand what happens um, when we pass. And, and then to be able to come back. So I worked on that premise. And so mystics have speculated that the Great Pyramid in Egypt was used to influence consciousness in ancient times. Um, but scientific research on how the Great Pyramid influences consciousness has been limited. And what we know and what I know from being involved in quite a few expeditions in various countries is that governments do not want us to find out these secrets. They block just about anything. And for some reason, I was given permission to take my equipment into the Great Pyramid on more than one occasion and uh, conduct this study. So I wanna share um, how this study worked. And, and these pictures that you're seeing um, are actually apparitions that were going across the sky. They're still pictures, but these, these apparitions were moving, which I find quite interesting. So in research, we need to create research questions. And so what we're looking to do is take variables and line them up and see if there's any kind of correlation between the variables. So I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of a lesson in how scientific research works and you know, I've been exposed to a lot of students who learned how to do it, but there's a lot of people who don't know how to do it. So one of the research questions was, to what extent does going inside the Great Pyramid affect the energy field and chakra system, but also is that effect sustained? 
So a hypothesis is you guess what you think might happen. So, um, and this is working with the terms from the GDV device that Dr. Konstantin Korotkov in Russia developed over a period of over 20 years. So inside the Great Pyramid, the energy field, and I'll show you how the data is, is uh, shown from the machine, but that inside the Great Pyramid, that the energy field, the volume of the person's aura will be affected and can be measured. So just the thing about the, the, the GDV device, it's actually a camera and it has something that blocks the light and it's measuring the photonic emissions off the human body and then transposing it into the logarithm in two different ways. Uh, and it's working on the meridians as in the Chinese system. So it either creates the energy field, you can make the process go one way, or it looks at the chakras and you'll see how this works. So this is a technical term, mean scores for virtual chakras inside will be closer to zero, which means there's a, co a correlation. So basically I'm predicting that there will be um, something that um, happens. Now, when we do a research project, the first thing we do is we look at the literature of what other people have said about this subject. Now, a lot of people think that research is reading other people's material and coming up with your own conclusion. That's actually a review of the literature. Okay, so lots of people have talked about Egypt and talked about mysticism and that sort of thing. But what I was trying to do is take science and bridge it with what the mystics had said. So mystics ascribe a high level of consciousness and secrets of ascension to the ancient Egyptians. And scholars in the past have taken a firm stand against this. And so basically academia wants to continue with what they have decided that pyramids are tombs and the ancient Egyptians were a little bit infantile and they didn't really know what they were doing. But all the way back in 1971, Peter Tompkins broke the mold by arguing that there was a link between the Great Pyramid and Egyptian mysteries. So Manley P. Hall, all the way back in 1928, described initiation ceremonies inside the sarcophagus and said that it was a doorway between the material world and the transcendental spheres of nature. And the speaker before me was speaking about connection to nature. Uh, you heard them say that I have a book, Angels and Archetypes, an Evolutionary Map of Feminine Consciousness. Feminine consciousness is all about connecting to nature. Uh, the patriarchy, I think, is at the root of the problems that we have in the world by lopping off the sacred feminine and lopping off connection to nature. So the initiate would learn that the soul is immortal, and they already knew that, as I said, the Egyptians didn't have a word for death, but that the soul extended beyond the physical world. So the Egyptians had two words for the, the soul, and ba and ka, and the ka is the body double, and some people have experiences where they astral travel in their sleep and it's and someone will actually see them and that's the ka and the ba is the part of the soul that continues when we drop our physical body so that's the physical body is finished but the soul continues so in Thompson's words the secret knowledge possessed by the hierarchy of initiates was communicated to those who could prove their worthiness by passing a long time, uh, a long period of probationary training and several trials. So initiates were trained one step at a time. And the idea was that they would be well versed in what was going on on the other side. And <clears throat> we're not prepared, like religion basically says you live once, you go to the pearly gates and God comes to contempt, condemn you. But that is the dogma of certain religions. And my interest has been to go back as far as possible into Egyptian initiation rites and understand uh, what they could have known. What could the ancient Egyptians have known? Okay, so then we have to look at the field, electromagnetic fields. Now, what does that mean? That somehow an electromagnetic, electromagnetic field is generated by the spinning of the chakras. Okay, what's a chakra? Chakras are energy centers that are connected to glands, the hormones in the, in the body. And um, the neural synapses don't touch. 
for the brain to get the message to lift our hand, a neural that a, a hormone jumps across the neural synapse to connect everything in the brain. Those uh, energy centers are chakras, and they can be in alignment, they can be uh, squished, they can be expanded, they can be uh, out of alignment in different ways. But there's some kind of field in the human body that is electromagnetic. Okay. So Moitiyama suggested that chakras have both subtle and physical forms, which supply energy from the outside world by pervading the astral body. So these are terms that we're not usually uh, well versed in, but it is the science of spirituality. So energetic properties of individual chakras can be contained in isolation and cited research indicating that chakras orchestrate in complex fields with one another happens due to their proximity. So understanding patterns of entrainment. Now, this is a very important word among chakras can illuminate an intersensory association known as synergy. So synesthesia. So synesthesia is a Greek word for blending senses. That's when someone can hear a picture, uh, see music, and it's common across babies, adults, and um, elderly people. But our world that focuses on material reality takes us away from that. And so what is consciousness if it isn't some kind of a cross-sensory perception? So I was using the research on synesthesia to, to, to help define the variables that I would use to measure what we're talking about here. So it's a union or a sensation that has loosely referred, been referred to as a sixth sense. So as people meditate more and eat better and uh, connect more with nature, the, somehow this psychic energy is developed. And the more we use it, the more it's developed. And so if we ignore it, uh, it, it, it it's, it's like a muscle. If we don't use a muscle, then we, we, if you don't use it, you lose it. So the rare capacity of cross-sensory perception is such as hearing pictures, seeing music, tasting shapes, somebody hands somebody a bouquet of roses on, on TV and you can smell them. So synesthesia has been observed in every age group, but it's considered abnormal because it's statistically rare. Okay, so I'm pulling in the idea that we can build on it. So understanding synesthesia can be linked to understanding brain functioning and consciousness. So it is possible to measure the unseen. So Satoic describes a neuroimmune endocrine network. Okay, this is all sounds very complicated, but I hope you can just relax and let these words come to you because it actually makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And most people aren't speaking using this vocabulary. So synergistic, which means coordinated, transmitters regulate glandular function, giving chemical feedback to hardwired portions of the nervous system. So we are not functioning at our full potential in this world that's telling us if you can't see it, it's not there. Profit is, the, is a higher value than consciousness. So all of us have been steered away from this truth, but it is measurable and it is true. So the glandular system is closely associated with the chakra system and neurotransmitters can be tagged and seen microscopically tracing energetic transfers between nerve fi fibers. So being psychic means being connected and being aware. So Konstantin Korotkov confirmed that photonic emissions from the human body can be photographed using an electrode system that creates a high intensity field called gaseous discharge visualization. So we were able to bring this GDV device into the Great Pyramid and, and do the measurements. A pretest happened and I'll explain more about that. We did the measurements inside the pyramid and then we did various post tests. So electrophotonic imaging, what it is is souped up biofeedback and um, and then they've been working with this for a while. So uh, EPI, uh, software programs that calculate over 30 param parameters, area, brightness, density, chakra alignment, energetic values associated with this technology. We talk about Carillion photography. Some of you have been to psychic fairs and you put your hand on a plate and you get your picture taken and your aura appears. Well, this is high definition uh, Karelian photography. It's based on the same principles. So Korkoff's um, 
GDV EPI invention measures logarithmically processes scores to evaluate alterations in psychological states and consciousness fields. So this is all very exciting. And this mach machine has been used throughout the world for, for sports psychology, for, for medical, it's a medical device used in Russia. And I was trained in Russia by Cord cost team, and it's really, really quite sophisticated. So I think most times when people hear about something for the first time, they go, oh, come on, that can't be true. Uh, but the longer you look into it, kind of like astrology, the more you appreciate it. So synesthesia has shown emotion is spread over multiple neural and glandular pathways, so transmodal areas, reciprocal connections between multimodal areas modulates parallel sensory perception. So we have got all of this going on in our body. When, 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 you, when you get a recognition reflex and the hair goes up on your arms uh, or you get uh, goosebumps, my friend even turned that into a verb, goosebumping, um, or you get a feeling in your gut that says, no, there's something wrong with this or a really open feeling that says, yes, I can trust this. And so all of this is what we're looking to measure how do we know? And knowing, as Hakim says in the Pyramid Code, the indigenous elder is a very deep power. So the architecture of the human brain, the glandular system and the chakra system exemplify transmodal connectivity. We should all have to learn this in school, I think. Okay, so now let's get into the, um, the actual design. So I had two groups, you do a pre-test and a post-test. One group um, it, it was in 2010 and one group was 2012. So the treatment is considered lying in the sarcophagus um, for uh, two minutes only because it, it has an immediate um, effect. And, um, and so I'll explain as I go along, but the second group, I had them do a post-test even later because one of the hypotheses was, does this effect last? And in my experience, spending a lot of time inside the Great Pyramid, inside the Sphinx, inside the tunnel system for years and years in Egypt was creating something in me that I was pretty, I had a, a hypothesis, a hunch that there was something related to the pyramid and to the, the energy fields on the Giza Plateau that was causing this to happen. So the subjects were people um, in my groups on the Magic Egypt trips, and they agreed to participate in the study. And so I did three GDV readings for each of the 30 subjects. So that was 90 readings uh, in October of 2010. The second was four readings for 60 subjects uh, in December of 2012. So data collection. So over a five day period, we measured before we went into the pyramid, we measured inside the pyramid, and we measured after. And group two did a post-test four days later. So while inside the pyramid, each subject spent two minutes lying in the sarcophagus in the king's chamber. Now, if you lie with your head in the proper direction, all of the energy fields connect into your pineal gland in the Great Pyramid. And so um, that's super important. Okay, I'm just watching my time. Okay. All right. So this is what the GDB offers in terms of measurement. And what you can see is the actual auric field can be measured in, in terms of size. Okay. And when there's gaps in the auric field, in the uh, auric field, which you can see inside the first top left picture, there's lots of gaps. And the understanding is that when there's gaps in the field, literally the protective coating around our human body is uh, not as strong. So as the field becomes stronger and larger, we're actually uh, more conscious, more healthy, and more able to function in the world. So these, looking at the raw data as it's pl plotted for each person, doesn't help us much. This quantitative research method means you've got more than 30 subjects, you've got more variables, and then you use data analysis and statistics that a lot of my students called sadistics um, because it was just so difficult to understand. 
but let's just keep going with the generated data sets. So the virtual chakras are actually looking at the alignment. So if you look at this subject sitting, it's replicating a man here. And the green band is what is considered normal. But what we're looking to do is have an alignment of the chakras. So what Korotkoff says is that if your chakras are misaligned to one side, it's preoccupation with self. And the other side, it's preoccupation with others, which to me is about empathy and narcissism, which is a study in itself. But for a person to be fully functioning, the, the chakras need to be robust and aligned. And there's something about that and the connection between the, the, the chakras informing each other that creates the psychic experience. So what you see, if you turn the, uh, the, the, the line drawing sideways, you'll see, well, sorry, you turn it to the left, you'll see how the chakras are, um, how they're misaligned to the center point. And then inside the pyramid, what was happening is the chakras were obviously affected, but it's almost like what I came to see after doing this study is that the chakras kind of split apart to allow for the out of body experience. And there was something about coming back after the experience, which they talk about in the mystical materials that they would have um, an experience of a star knowledge experience. And, and this is more than we can speak about right now. But the trick was to return. One of the things that's talked about in psychic experiences, out of body experiences, it's easy to leave, but how do you come back and integrate the information? So obviously the chakras were affected. And then after, then what you see in the circles that aren't colored is where the chakras were before. Um, and so after there was this alignment and the crown chakra was slightly out of alignment, but that is quite remarkable that the chakras are robust, they're big. And as you could see in the previous one, the lower two, three chakras were smaller, which meant they were not, they didn't have the same energetic value is what we're talking about. So here's the data. And so then the data analysis uh, through the statistical analysis software, and this is just a technical term, uh, two, two tailed correlations, but basically um, the, the simple way of saying, okay, here's your crash course in one sentence of statistical analysis. Okay, the probability that something happened by chance, a mild statistical correlation is that 95%, so probability is less than 0.05, that it happened by chance. That's a mild correlation. A moderate correlation is that one in 100 chances that it happened by chance, like 99% it did not happen by chance. But what we're looking for, for strong statistical analysis, this did not happen by chance. And you do that with numbers, you do that with the, the, the size of the group and it's the computers checking every possibility. And so probability is less, less than one in a thousand that this could have happened by chance. So what it's saying is that the treatment, which is being inside the sarcophagus, actually did something. That's what we're looking for. Okay. So the energy fields and the mean scores before, inside, after, and the delayed post-test. So specific patterns of entrainment between and among the chakras were found with all of these mild, moderate, and strong statistical significance. So what the data is showing is that it didn't happen by chance. Now, again, you, you have to be a little bit statistically minded to understand these different patterns. But the, the point of the matter is, is that this, I'm just showing you the raw data because too many times people uh, say it happened and we know when it happened for sure. And that's why I think it's really important. And this is what peer reviewed journal uh, articles do is they show you the data to let the, the reader assess, did you have strong research methodology and did it work? So this, these are the chakras plotted, but again, it's each individual person. And my point of showing you this is that if you just look at one person, you can't get the picture of what was happening to everyone as a group statistically. And that's the difference. So qualitative research methods, uh, you can measure 
you know, Johnny's having a problem in school. So you interview the parents, the teacher, the friends, the principal, and they go, well, you know, I don't, uh, and they come up with some kind of idea about what could be wrong with Johnny. That's qualitative where you're looking at one person and that's usually what a pilot project is. And you get your hypothesis because you've done a preliminary analysis, but you're not doing statistics. Statistics is only for quantitative, which means numbers. So here's, you know, I'm just showing you the data. And mostly it's to show that the chakras moved all over the place. And it, it doesn't look like it's coherent. Okay. And so it's basically looking that there's no effect here until you do the statistical analysis. Okay, and then the energy frequency, because we did a test, the pre-test was outside the pyramid and the post-test was inside the pyramid. So it's definitely showing that there's a difference in the energy frequency between inside and outside. And some people will tell you that the, and I've experienced this myself, that outside the pyramid is a very strong energetic field. It's just not the same, and it's not having the same effect as inside the pyramid. So standard deviations, just that's just another technical term. I'm just showing you all this raw data, but now here come the results. Okay, and I'm excited about this. Okay, so what I did is I took the numbers, which you'll see in a minute, and then I looked at the correlations between the chakras. My hypothesis was that if the chakras were speaking to each other, that's how you get the hair on your arms and the gut feeling, is that there's some kind of a connection between your head and your communication and your heart and something is talking within the person. Okay, so back, so this is 10, 10, 10, and I'm also going to be showing you the difference between two years later. Okay. So the energy field is not connecting with any of the chakras in here. And there is a mild correlation between the orange and the red, between the, the belly and the root. There is a moderate, sorry, that's a moderate correlation. The mild correlation was between the stomach and the crown. And then the only connection before, before people had the experience of going inside the pyramid was they had a connection between their third eye and their throat chakra. That, that was strong before they started. So then they go inside the pyramid and the auric field is now connecting between the, the chakras and the energy field, which was super significant, I thought. Okay, so what you see is you still got the crown chakra and the third eye, and that's the mild connection, right? And But then the auric field was connecting almost each of the chakras except the heart, which I thought was interesting. Um, so there was a statistically significant pattern going on across all 30 subjects that showed up statistically as significant. But then the post-test, what it started was an entrainment between the chakras and between the energy field. So in other words, the experience of going inside the pyramid in 2010 of these 30 subjects was that after they came out, the chakras were speaking to each other in a very significant way. Okay, the only connection that had the the one in a thousand probability was between the heart and the energy field. So that somehow developed as the experience integrated. So and that's the other thing, like like I and as I said at the beginning, and where the hypothesis came from was that over time, after spending a lot of time inside the Great Pyramid that's when I started to feel that the psychicness was integrating. It wasn't while I was in the pyramid that all of a sudden I know anything really, but 
there's something about the energy of the pyramid and being inside the sarcophagus where all the energy is hitting the pineal gland that was doing something that took a while to integrate. Okay. So this, this, these, these are the numbers. And if you don't understand statistics, you'll never guess how that is going to turn into those drawings, which is why I'm showing you after. But when you see the little star, you can see that it's 0 0.04, which is less, probability is less than 0 0.05. So the significance of the numbers is showing up wherever you see a star. And then I took these and I plotted them, that's all. So when you see two stars, it's less than one in a thousand. Okay, so don't try to understand that. Um, but at, at glance, I'm showing you um, where I got that from. So then I, I thought, because something really happened in 2010 and we were told that 1212 was coming or 1221 the end of the mayan calendar and that energy was going to be so significant and ascension was coming and so my question was would two years make a difference generally in terms of the energy um without doing anything and again how would you measure that like lots of people have been speculating that there was something about the end of the Mayan calendar that was significant, um, but significant how? I wanted to know if it was st significant statistically. So before the subjects even went in, um, the chakras were quite aligned. Now think if this is you and your crown chakra is speaking to your heart and speaking now, I, I didn't put the numbers in here, but the thick lines are the less than one in a thousand, and the medium line is uh, one in a hundred, and the the faint line is uh, one five in a hundred. So so the strong lines are the one in a thousand less than one in a thousand chance that it happened by accident. So things are not so connected to communication. They're connected to intuition. So the solar plexus, which is our, our, our self, sense of self and, and personal power and connected to our gut response. So nothing was really connected to the root chakra. Uh, the throat was now universally more connected to the energy field, making people's communication connect to the robustness of their auric field. Uh, but there was a lot of crisscross uh, correlation. So much more connected before they went into the pyramid than two years before. And some of the subjects were the same that had come on the other trip, but mostly it was different people. And those are the numbers again. So then when they were during inside um, the, the pyramid, now we have this kind of swooping um, connection. And I mean, if join me with this, um, if, if all of the different hormonal states and the energy field and the chakras are communicating with one another, you will be more psychic, I think. I think that's a good way to show it. And look at this after. Everything was connected to everything, okay? But not so much to the energy field. But this is where I wanted to see if we did a delayed post test with the second group, um, what would connect? And it wasn't as much. So this is where the biggest connection was right away after. So and the other thing is just because we have a hypothesis and we're looking to see if the data supports the hypothesis, it doesn't mean we're right. And I think a lot of paid research for pharmaceuticals uh, bends the research, bends the data to say, see, it's safe, right? And that's happening. And uh, perhaps it isn't well known, but um, if you dig around a little bit, you'll find that. So it's really important as a researcher to be willing to be wrong but to see what happens. So in each of the studies that I've done for my master's thesis, my PhD dissertation, these kinds of studies that I did independently after, mostly I was wrong. Meaning that my best guess at what variable influenced what was naive, okay? 
I couldn't see deep enough without doing the literature review and looking at the data. And the data became, it, it, it informed my private practice. It informed how I conducted my, my work. I worked as a psychologist for 35 years. Um, and so that's the value of, of research is to allow yourself to be surprised and to allow what happened to teach you something. So the after test to me was the most coherently connected in the 1212 group. And that's what the data showed. So, um, and I hope you're generating a lot of questions. So this is just the comparison of means and I, I don't wanna get into the data, but what you can see in, in the data, the actual numbers um, is that there's definitely an effect you may not know how to explain the effect, but you can see that the orange lines are stronger than the blue lines. And so the, the, the first, the blue lines is 10, 10, and the orange lines is 12, 12. So I'm here to say that I think that it was measurable in this narrow experiment that there was a difference in the energy field between 2010 and 2012. Okay. so. What can we conclude from this? Uh, we can conclude that going inside the pyramid and lying in the sarcophagus in the king's chamber for two minutes with your head in the right direction uh, clearly impacts the human aura. I think we can conclude that. Uh, data show that time for integration may affect the results. Okay. Uh, the experience initiates uh, have is a pattern of entrainment between, no, sorry, the experience initiates a pattern of entrainment between the chakras, a network of synergetic transmitters, creating energetic transfers between the nerve fibers and the neurotransmitters. This to me is how we get smarter. Once there is more of a connection, and that's when you're trying to understand something, you want your brain to connect and you want to have an aha you want to feel connected to the experience. And that's what our society has done is disconnect, disconnect, disconnect. One discipline doesn't speak to the other discipline. They don't want us thinking. They don't want creative thinking. They don't want us figuring things out. So anything I say that we can do that reconnects us, reconnects us to nature, reconnects us to ourselves is going to be useful for the development of humanity. And I think that that is particularly challenged these days. Okay, so it seems that the, it seems clear that the pyramid did not affect all subjects in the same way. And when I went for my training in Russia, and I was I was showing the trainers the data, um, and 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 the trainer not knowing much about pyramids or what I was trying to do, and she just blurted out, "You can't expect them to all experience the same thing. You can't expect them to all be affected just because they went in the pyramid." So. You know, her idea was that it was a far-fetched notion that anything could happen uh, in a statistical way. And she wasn't familiar with the literature review and all of that. But basically, in her opinion, uh, it was a long shot to think that anything could happen. But we see statistically that something did happen. So it stands to reason since in today's society, initiation and consciousness fields are not well understood and subjects likely did not know how to handle the increased energy. Now, when people, I spent a lot of time inside the pyramid by myself and I brought a lot of groups in uh, for private meditation. Now, the other thing is that if there's the general public in the pyramid at the same time, all of their, take my picture, you know, is, is and, and, and sacrilegious, not knowing how to be quiet or meditative. It's just enough to blow my head off. You know, it's just like, it's so augmented. So when we go in there, I want people to be meditative, move, because you hear every single footstep. I mean, it's a harmonic resonance field. There's no question of that. And um, anyway, so um, it, it's not, we have to, we have to integrate the energy, I think, individually. And so many people don't know how to handle that. And, and it's, it's, it, it of course, it, it, most of the time research raises more questions than it answers. And sometimes a really good question is better than a mediocre answer. 
Okay, so this may be the reason subject chakras slipped out of alignment when exposed to the energy of the Great Pyramid. So looking at the individual um, experience of each of the, what is it, 80, sub, no, 90 subjects, it's almost like the chakras were opening up to allow the out-of-body experience, something like that. I mean, that's inconclusive. That's something that I surmised. See, so there's a difference between a hunch or an idea and data, okay? So only one sub subject had the strongest reading for the energy field inside the pyramid. So most everybody, their energy field became stronger and more stable after, okay? One subject was strongest when she went in and then she lost energy, but that's one out of 80, which is, you know, not significant. Okay, so examining the raw data for the chakras, the pyramid had a dramatic effect on subjects, but it may be that subjects needed more time and more exposure. Like this was the one and only time most of them had ever been inside the pyramid. Right. And so I've spent 100 hours in there minimum. OK, so future studies, the post test can be delayed, allowing for time for integration. The literature on synesthesia shed some light on cross sensory perception, multiple neural and glandular pathways and transmodal areas of communication within the body and patterns of entrainment were shown. And I think that entrainment is what happens when we meditate when you know we do yoga when we do things that are synthesizing and clarifying and centering us we end up with patterns of entrainment and you know even when women's menstrual cycles if they're not flying through the air too much when they work together they become entrained so what is entrainment if you have a room full of clocks and they're going tick tock and they're all over the place eventually they all start to entrain okay uh, so this invites further study to gain more understanding of the, the affect, affect being the, the, how it comes to our feelings on the human aura and chakra system. So the most unexpected finding is that the energetic frequency outside the great, great pyramid was not only higher, it was more stable, which speaks to the idea that the purpose of the pyramids was for a more global universal uh, effect for humanity that Akeem would say it was for peace and food and that the pyramids were built to have a stabilizing positive energetic effect for the planet, not just for the people. But we know that it, or we can assume that it was the high level initiates that went in to handle the intense energy of the pyramid. So further study and additional measurements will be collected to establish that this is typical or if a unique influence was present on the day of testing. Okay, so basically all research uh, sets you up for more research. And there's the references that, uh, that I used. Okay, so we do have some time for um, questions. And so you can find information uh, on uh, various archived interviews that I've done and trips to Egypt on pyramidcode.com. And right now I'm working on the new Atlantis, which is a sequel to the pyramid code five episodes. Um, and I'm in the editing stage now, and I plan to finish it by the end of the year. And that's what I have to say. And I do have a little video for you which comes out of the pyramid code. Let me just make it full screen. No, 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 no. Sorry. Hold on. View. Huh, it doesn't want to go full screen. No, 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 no. Sorry. I want to play this for you. Come on. All right. I hope you can still see that. So I started the model of standing inside a sphere with the idea that each of those cross quarter points could be informative for a way that we perceive information. And then I use that for 
Okay, why isn't it finishing? Let's try that again. All right, so I hope you have lots of questions. And here come the chakras. So that just happens to be an animation that I described to the animators for the pyramid code. And this is what they came up with. And um, I'll stop sharing. And, uh, and then I use that as a model to plot the data on. All right, so ready for questions. Hi, Carmen. Thank you so much. It was a very beautiful talk. Really enjoyed it. You shared a lot of information about the pyramids and the chakras. Yes, we have received a few questions from our participants. And the first question is, when we talk about the mystical powers of the Great Pyramid and the significance of chakras with it, how powerful will it be if we were to visualize ourselves sitting inside it? Visualize yourself instead of going there. Yes, sitting um, in, visualizing like sitting inside of it, inside of the pyramid. Well, that, that's an interesting question because there are seven characteristic features to a an energetically functioning pyramid, and I'm sure that your community here is well aware of that. Um, and it has an effect. We know that on some level. How we measure it is different, but people have made pyramids out of wood, out of copper, and sat meditating inside them. So there's something about the plain field of a pyramid that can um, focus energy, that can help us create a field around us. And so in a way we can say it's a metaphor and it's a reality. So imagining and visualizing yourself meditating in a pyramid is a useful exercise. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any difference between the Russian pyramid and the Giza pyramid of Egypt? You mean uh, Valery Uberov's Russian, the new pyramid that he built? Um, yes, of course. Yes. Uh, well, he, he studied the principles. And yes, there's differences. One's new, one's old. Uh, one, the crystals come from Brazil. Um, I, I've had a lot to do with the work that he's done there. And... Um, but, but, okay, I'll tell you a story. When the construction workers, before the casing stones were on and before the capstone was on, when they were working in the pyramid, there was one of the construction workers who had a severe asthmatic condition and he was standing in the pyramid, the chambers were there, the structure was there, there it was made out of crushed quartz, the base of it. And this man started to tremble and sweat on one side of his body and he had this healing crisis right in the pyramid and he was healed. He never needed his asthmatic thing again. And so I think that all of the different pieces, the, the, the casing stones were like a fondant icing that they, they actually made crushed quartz polymer that they spread on the outside of the pyramid and then it hardened. Um, and then that again made an, another insulation for the outside of the pyramid. And so the capstone changed the energy and they've done quite a bit of measurement in there. Um, but the, the reason, as I understand it from Valerie Uberoff, they, that the people who funded that pyramid, which was $5 million, was a produce company that wanted a place, to, a warehouse, if you will, to place food to make it stronger and better for the people uh, before it got on the, the trucks to get transported to people to the stores. And they used the basement of the pyramid for the food. And the rest of it they've used for experiments. So I think that's pretty darn sophisticated. Okay, thank you so much. And another question is, as you speak of entrainment, what exactly happens to our chakra system during the process of entrainment? Okay, I think it's like communication. So we can all sit in a room and meditate and never say anything to each other. But once we start to have discussions and go, yeah, I think that too. Well, maybe I don't, maybe I do. It's like the chakras are communicating with each other. They're speaking to each other. So entrainment means connection. And I think of them as a handle. So when you've got a handle between your third eye and your communication, 
then you've got clarity of vision and clarity of speech, right? And when you've got connection between your heart and your crown chakra or your heart and your power center, then you're working harmonically. So entrainment is keeping everything aligned so it augments the power and energy of any chakra to be entrained with another chakra. That's how I've come to understand it. Okay. Thank you so much. We receive a similar type of question like chakra slips out of alignment. What does this mean and what effect does it have? Okay. Um, uh, when chakras shift, shape, shift out of alignment, a lot of times they're more constrained. So the energy is not, it's like somebody putting their hands around your throat. You can't quite breathe as well. So they're not functioning as fully. I've seen it where uh, the chakras hit the wall, they say. So it's all the way out. The green zone is considered normal, but I don't think that's good enough. I think we need most of our chakras in line. To one side, it's overemphasis on others. And sometimes people can be codependent and they forget about themselves and they're helping, helping other people and they, they, but they don't take care of themselves. So that is a shift that's not good for the self because we're more help. It's not that we're not supposed to help people. Don't get me wrong, but we're more helpful to them when we're aligned. The other way can be narcissistic where it's all about me. I don't care about you. Gimme, 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 me, me, me. I'm right. I'm right. I don't care about you because I'm right. Okay. And that is very dangerous. And I think, you know, Facebook, social media, uh, modeling by certain people in, in politics have created an increasing narcissism that makes fun of empathetic people. But if we're really trying to fix the planet, we need a world of empathetic people. And what we've been doing is promoting and encouraging narcissism. So either one of them is out of alignment but we need to come together all for one and one for all. If it isn't good for everybody, it's not good at all. So if we were all aligned and we were all had our chakras entrained, I think we would make decisions that are good for people, good for everything on the planet, good for nature, good for the environment, and never mind profit so much. Okay. So wonderful. Thank you. And other question is, if a layman was to understand the entire concept, how would you explain it? What was the first word? If a layman, if a common man, like if a layman, if he wants to understand the entire concept, like who don't know about the pyramids, if he's new, very new to the technology, new to the pyramid technology, if a layman wants to understand the entire concept, how would you like to explain it? Well, Hakeem would have said it's food. It's food for people. Uh, food in an energetic way, just the way good food can nourish our system. Uh, there's a way that natural energy can fuel people, the public. And so it, it makes a cohesive energetic field, electromagnetic field where people feel good. But when we see people now, people are anxious, they're suspicious, they're arguing with each other, they want to be right. Like we are in a um, dystopic phase of disconnect, 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 you're against me, he's wrong, I'm right, you know, and it just doesn't work. So there was a system on the planet, and, and matriarchy isn't the opposite of patriarchy, by, by developing our feminine consciousness, we don't ignore our masculine consciousness and men have feminine consciousness inside them. Women have masculine consciousness. So if we integrate and include, include all people, children, age groups and respect everyone, we live harmoniously. And so the energy of the pyramids and they're all over the world, Dr. Samos Manigich from the Bosnian Pyramid Project would tell you that there's 80,000 pyramids on the planet small ones, big ones, new ones, old ones, and that there was a time where harmony uh, between all people on the planet was a goal. And we are now at the far extreme of the pendulum showing us what happens when we are divisive and we don't care about each other. We just care about ourselves. And so 
the point was a functional humanity. Okay. Yes, Herman. And the effect you spoke, uh, you spoke about the pyramid, does it affect, uh, does this affect only in the Great Pyramid or any pyramid like? Uh, Okay, that's a, that's a decent question. Uh, the bent pyramid, no, 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 no. Um, step pyramid in Saqqara that's shaped like this with a flat top actually had grave goods in it. And my understanding is that a flat topped pyramid is a mastaba. Okay, so when they say pyramids are tomb, no. The, the characteristic features of a straight sided pyramid uh, makes it functional. Now, the angle can be different but they have chambers inside that are positioned in different places, almost like uh, notes on a flute, right? They always have a water system underneath, a system of tunnels. They are created with different kinds of stone that insulate and transmit energy, almost like the, the, um, an electrical cord that has a protective coating on the outside and different kinds of wires. And that they always have crystalline structures uh, so and and so the, the and they are aligned where they're placed on the ground, especially in Egypt. It looks like you just scattered them, but if you align a star map, the, they're, they're literally connected to stars. And in the Great Pyramid, the passageways from the Queen's Chamber and the King's Chamber point to stars. And so these are um, they're they're all functional in their own way, and they're connected to a different. Uh, star system. And it seems because of the size and the positioning of the Great Pyramid that it, it seems to have more energetic functioning than the others, but the jury is not out on that because research is still being conducted. And who knows if new pyramids could do the same thing. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Carmen, <clears throat> really. And it was a very wonderful talk. Once again, thank you so much.